All right, let's get started. Thanks for joining everyone. My name is Kristen Malzone and I am the community manager for the CA security community. If you're not already a member of the CA security community, I will post a link in the uh, chat window. Please join CA communities and follow the CA security community to stay up to date on all the latest news, webcasts, and information about the CA Identity Suite products as well as the other CA security products. Um, today's webcast is a community webcast on the top reasons why identity management projects fail and how to avoid them. I will be posting the recording and the slides from today's webcast to the security community as well as uh, sending out a follow-up email to all attendees today. So look for that email from me to later today or tomorrow. So today's presenter is Molly Vanamali, who works for CA Services in North America. So I'd like to thank Molly for, for hosting this, this webcast today, and we look forward to the presentation. I am going to open it up for live Q&A at the end, so you can ask questions through the Q&A panel or over the phone. Um, but during Molly's presentation, feel free to post your questions in the chat window or the Q&A window. So thanks again, Molly. I'll pass it over to you. Oh, thank you, Christian. Appreciate it for the intro. Uh, good morning, everyone. As uh, Christian said, uh, this is Somali Vanamali, and uh, uh, thanks to you all for joining us um, for this session. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview on what the agenda today is, and then drill down into those. Um, as Christian said, feel free to send in your Q and A to the Q and A panel, and uh, I will keep addressing them if there are specific uh, bullet points as they walk through the presentation, and uh, we will take a few other questions at the end of the session um, you know, or any additional clarification that you may need. Um, so the primary, you know, re the identity management project, you know, fails for a number of different reasons, but there are key triggers um, that kind of, you know, alluding to those failures, and uh, I'm listing, you know, a few of them down here in terms of what are those. Um, number one, right, it's fundamentally identity management projects are a little bit more complex than a um, standard project that you might see in a security um, environment. Um, primary uh, reason around the complexity is the underlying business processes. These, are, uh, these have been evolving over a period of time, and um, you, most of the time you're trying to retrofit these business processes into our project, and, um, and not much thought has gone through uh, in you know, validating those business process and making certain changes to it as part of the project execution. And the other reason is the projects are a lot more complex is the different types of user population that we have to deal with. And a good example is um, you have um, you know, full-time employees, and you have uh, vendors, contractors, uh, seasonal workers. Each of these user population have their own unique set of requirements to match as part of entitlements pertaining to the job function. And that becomes a lot more convoluted uh, process uh, rather than trying to, you know, provide a one stock standard set of entitlements and uh, try to meet the automation uh, aspects of your uh, project execution. And supporting business rules for these automation pertaining to different user population is also um, is going to be on a varying degree, you know, in terms of number of business rules that you need to provision, deprovision, and to manage lifecycle events. These are, again, you know, drive the uh, certain amount of complexity within the project. So um, part of the reason that we see um, the certain challenges within the identity management project are the project complexity uh, pertaining to specific points as I was talking about it. And Let's um, take a look at the um, you know, top reasons why we see certain projects uh, failing. And I want to make a, a quick difference in a sense. A failure mean, doesn't mean that the project has not gone into production or the project is, um, you know, is totally been dropped or not the, it's not being used at all. There is a slight difference. As long as the business do not see the perceived value or the project sponsor do not see um, the perceived value of the solution, the project may 
still be in limbo in terms of the perceived value. This we have seen a number of um, occasions, and uh, these different reasons are going to really point out to, you know, why those diminished value in the project has occurred. Um, so there's a slight difference between the technical value proposition versus the business value proposition. Technically, technical organization may see the value in terms of what's been achieved, but from the business perspective, you know, if you're looking for improving the ROI or improving the bottom line, you know, improving the efficiency of the um, organization, then if those um, trade, you know, metrics are not met, business may see this as, a, you know, not getting this value that's expected as opposed to the technical organization says, well, we are doing automation and we are also, you know, seeing some improvements in our own, in our life. So that is there's a varying degree of uh, understanding as to what is the real value proposition and what may be you know, deemed as a project failure. So with that, I'm going to drill down into the uh, you know, five top reasons and um, least um, reason to the most important reason in a reverse order and uh, touch base on um, you know, additional pointers as to why you know, some might feel it as a success and some may not feel it as successful project. Um, this is a very common scenario that we have seen within CA you know, projects. Um, time allocated for testing is insufficient uh, to a varying degree. Um, fundamentally, uh, you know, testing is, can take from three weeks to you know, purely a functional testing, use case testing, to a lot more you know, um, in-depth um, to, you know, test case driven testing. Um, when you peel the layer of functional use cases, there are going to be specific functional requirements. You know, the classic example is creating a user is a, you know, it's a simple functional use case as a new hire, but then underneath it, you may have additional functional requirements, creating a unique ID, creating a unique email address, and, you know, evaluating, you know, who the manager is and updating certain manager information in certain endpoints. So these functional requirements are very critical in evaluating how far your functional use cases is successful. And most of the time, the amount of detail that goes into those test cases at the functional requirements level is somewhat limited. And uh, another example, you know, the um, scope of testing. How much do we, you know, uh, test um, and um, how often we, you know, understand the testing component is um, you know, is complete. Um, another good example is, you know, in a modify user where you might see a user data getting updated in a part of um, certain modify operation coming in, but if there are within the HR feed, you have action and reason code where somebody is going on an LOA or somebody is going on, um, on a, you know, maternity leave or somebody is on a legal hold after their termination may still be a modify user without a termination flag being on or it could be a termination flag without, you know, legal hold is on. These uh, nuances within the data set may impact in terms of how much amount of testing you need to do to evaluate these individual components. And another, you know, common problem mm -hmm. that we um, mm -hmm. see here is the, you know, the type of data that is being created for testing. Um, you know, it's a varying degree. Some people take a real production data, obfuscate, um, certain personal information and, you know, change the user IDs and names, but retain the core uh, life cycle events as much as possible to validate these test cases. And some people go down the path of, you know, creating a mock data altogether, you know, at the functional requirement, at the functional use case level, but then forgetting about these nuances that you need to take care of it at the business rule level. So, um, you know, there's a balancing act that needs to be exercised in how much testing that you need to allocate or time you need to allocate for the testing. Um, testing shouldn't become an afterthought and um, we should not discover um, certain, you know, scenarios after going into production to say, oops, you know what, we didn't cover this specific scenario that we are seeing it for the first time. That shouldn't be the case. So in an ideal scenario, the testing sh team should get involved right from the get-go either from the requirements or at least from the design phase, understand the specific functional requirements, and then put together the set of test cases that's needed 
at the functional requirement level rather than at the functional use case level. And this is another uh, common problem that we're kind of trying to come across, right, um, where organizations are strapped with um, in a budget and they don't really have um, uh, resources uh, to take care of certain things on, on you know, as part of the project and are sharing the burden. Um, and then they, you know, they have their organizations try to do a lot of stuff um, and with, uh, with less either in resources or funding. Um, one of the common things that we come across is the challenge around overloading the requirements. And this is fundamentally um, a critical when it comes to uh, the scope of the project. Um, and the project are typically, you know, identity management projects are not like a single, you know, one-off one -off thing. That's very important to remember. It is, um, it's a program. And a program may have multiple projects or a project, you can call it as a project with multiple phases. You can even, you know, trip the, the phases into releases. And you can go a little bit more agile about showing um, you know, time to value to the business to say that rather than waiting for this complete project to finish with all the functionalities available over, you know, nine to 18 months period, rather I can target, you know, low hanging for some specific use cases and alleviate certain, you know, auditing requirements or certain um, key business pain points in terms of deprovisioning, provisioning, whatever it may be and, you know, strip the project into smaller chunks and, you know, and don't worry about the end date being aggressive. Of course, you can meet the end date as long as, you know, we are able to prioritize the functional use cases and the requirements and provide that time to value roadmap and see how you can deploy certain functionalities and capabilities over a period of time is going to be critical for the success of the project. Um, Another common one that we come across is um, to uh, not uh, doing a complete functional requirement analysis. Um, as I said, identity management project is, you know, can get very, you know, complex and how much of the functional requirements are understood and how much of this has been documented during the requirement phase is going to be critical to the proper design and the development effort that goes with the um, in implementation process. Um, functional requirements, again, shouldn't become an afterthought. Um, classic example of functional requirements, you know, we talked about, you know, um, new hire, rehire, of what happens in a rehire scenario. And if you're looking at a, a transfer, you know, what happens in a transfer? And if there are um, action and reason code would impact the um, aspect of um, the business rule that goes with it, then these functional requirements need to be documented and the proper design is in place to support them. And another big uh, challenge that we see, you know, most of the common IDM projects are either related to migrating from a cost solution in a homegrown um, or homegrown solution, a cart being migrating from an, another competitive vendor or um, a particular product that you had that's not really meeting your new business requirements or changing business um, theme and you're adopting a new solution. And sometimes these solutions are in a varying, you know, um, a construct. Some are rule-based and some are, you know, role-based. So when you are trying to migrate from some of these uh, complex uh, situations, um, you know, there are components that you need to take into consideration. And in particular, if you're migrating a massive solution like a homegrown solution where, um, you know, ad hoc scripts and uh, homegrown request systems, um, try to have a coexistence strategy to the very first point, overloading the requirement, right? So coexistence strategy is gonna give you that little leeway you need to show some time to value. At the same time, you know, you are able to release, uh, go through a release schedule where you can implement this solution in a progressive way. So um, there are some key considerations that you need to take into account as part of scoping this, um, the project itself. And this is uh, one, of, um, one of the um, you know, key of the reasons 
you know, in a, in a sense that organizations are trying to show value to the business, and one of the fundamental reasons that we are trying to implement an IDM solution is to provide automation. And automation can be defined in different degree of levels as to, you know, creating a user in a given endpoint and dropping the accounts, but to, you know, providing appropriate entitlements that goes with that user creation process. Sometimes organizations, I've seen this, right? Um, one particular organization, they said, hey, we are only going to do, um, you know, new hire, a rehire scenario for automation, and we will do termination. We're going to hold on to all transfers or any other modification of the user are going to be performed manually. And the challenge here is the so-called perceived value of automation is lost. Um, business were expecting them to get some ROI, and post-implementation, there were five, you know, security administration personnel who were involved. Um, two were let go, one was transitioned out to a different job within the organization. So security organization was left with just two folks. And they were able to show, hey, we have ROI, right? We saved X amount of dollars from, you know, letting go a few folks. And then from an automation perspective, all the transfers and the modify operations were still manual. And predominantly within the HR feed, most of the operations that are happening are related to transfers and change in a user, you know, a profile data in terms of that requires manual intervention to take action, like somebody is moving in, somebody is becoming a contractor from an employee, and some of those use cases were not being automated. And the reminder of those two security administrators were overwhelmed with the amount of work they have to do, and there were delays being caused again, and the business was asking, I thought we implemented the solution, and what is the outcome? We're not seeing the value here. I think the solution is not meeting our requirements anymore. So there is this lack of understanding as to, you know, what is the real value versus what is the perceived value. So you can't just go with how far it measures when it comes to certain amount of automation. And, you know, if there are certain scenarios, at least the level setting where the business should happen to say, you know, what is the real, you know, uh, automation and how this should happen. And um, another big challenge, right, how much of this are we are going to, you know, um, from an entitlement management perspective, um, are we going to provide um, job function specific entitlements through both right role definition? Are we going to just perform basic provisioning and then manage all aspects of entitlement through a self-access request system so they have to request for it and they have to go through an approval? So that's, again, a balancing act. So it's important for organizations to consider a certain amount of birth rate role definition that includes job function specific entitlements and move away from, you know, access request system that are only, you know, required for what I would call um, the, um, what is the word, um, non-function uh, specific or across project specific, uh, you know, entitlements. So there's a variation in terms of how you need to consider birth rate role definition and, um, and what needs to be requested outside of the norm, per se. And another uh, huge challenge that we come across is, you know, businesses are not uh, engaged to re-engineer certain level of, you know, business process. Um, this is a very, you know, um, critical to the success of the project. This is a classic example, right, that we typically come across. Organization, you know, they are performing a new hire, and then certain privileges cannot be given until they go through the background checks. Now, the process of doing a background check is all manually driven. There's a spreadsheet, you know, HR is getting involved, they put some flags, manages review, and it has its own computer process. And then it's sent to the IT security around provisioning certain extra privileges that are not given as a norm into the, you know, as part of the initial onboarding process. 
And sometimes these users are already vetted out and the background checks are done, but after the user creation, there is still a manual intervention that's involved to address this. And it would be prudent for the organization to engage the business to say, upon all this completion of this, what if we can automate this component as well by flagging an extra component in the HR feed to say, is a background check being done, true or false? And even if it's done after the fact and it is captured within the HR feed process, the manual intervention that's needed to provision these ad hoc uh, requirements, it's not even an ad hoc, right? It's part of the job function, but there's an extra flag comes into play. And then the automation can be performed. So as long as the business is involved and the process is redefined, then the automation can be performed without any manual intervention. And I'm willing to engage the business and treat this as more of a technical related uh, uh, you know, process could impede in terms of you know, the value proposition that solution is you know, expected to provide. And this is another common scenario, right? This is particularly related to when you have when you are migrating from either a homegrown solution or an alternative solution, you cannot try to retrofit the solution in the way it was behaving previously. If you have, for example, a role-based um, in an IDM system, and you're migrating to a you know um, rule-based or vice versa, rule versus role, role versus rule. The underlying construct in which your automation should happen is totally different. And I have seen organizations are not able to make that switch from the migration aspect and then trying to provide you know, the same kind of functionality in the older system by engineering a lot of custom coding. And this is what I call an 80-20 rule. So, it, 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 you know, at least minimum 80% of your core functionality should be driven by the standard out-of-the-box solution. And you can try to extend the solution to advanced configurations, you know, what we call it inside CIDM, you know, as you all know, PX policy, or, you know, very few JavaScripts and codes, you know, that cannot be migrated in the very first instance because you don't have enough time to go through the business process changes that are needed in the first iteration. You try to accommodate certain amount of advanced customization, you know, advanced configuration or through custom coding, you know, try to migrate the solution rather than trying to, you know, fit a square peg in a round hole. And then, you know, further down the road, you may not really see the value of the solution. And in a sense, not just in the very first iteration, as you go through the upgrades and the new releases, migrating the custom coding and the recompilation and the APAs that are not or deprecated or available could, you know, um, let the, you know, the, the solution implode in itself, if not immediately, probably in the future. So proper consideration should be in play when you are you know, trying to migrate or uh, move away from even a homegrown solution for that matter, because homegrown solutions are loosely put together scripts with a lot of tribal knowledge internally held. And um, certain times, um, you know, these things are not captured in full as part of the previous, you know, um, challenges. You know, detailed functional requirement needs to be, you know, um, uh, captured. So it is important to, you know, uh, bring in the, uh, the, uh, the tribal knowledge as part of those migration efforts. Um, lack of business involvement, that we talked about it, right? We cannot, IDM as a solution is very, very pervasive. It actually, um, you know, impacts different parts of the business. You know, if we are doing um, onboarding and life cycle events, um, it, we can't just put uh, you know, our blinders on to say, hey, you know, I'm just doing endpoint management. I mean, these are 
folks who are performing certain tasks on those endpoints and they need appropriate access. And involving the business from the get-go to make sure that required business processes are uh, applied and um, we are accommodating to those business process changes that's been agreed upon and the solution is built correctly is very critical in terms of the success of this uh, solution. Um, just try and go through and see if there are any questions been showing up on the QA panel. Um, I don't see any questions right now. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to, to ask them in the chat window or the Q&A panel. Um, and we can open it up for live Q&A at the end. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Um, and then this is the, um, you know, top most reason that I always come across, you know, even at the CA. Um, and you all can relate to this, you know, personally as well as to the uh, number one, you know, pro reason for certain projects, you know, not delivering the pursued value or even projects or derails um, is the scope grid, right? Um, once the requirements are defined and we go into a development mode, we have to lock that box. You know, that's the terminology I use. You cannot, you know, keep the requirements keep coming in throughout the development cycle. And I have seen in certain instances requirements are well into QA, while the QA testing is going on, there is a constant requirement and a change in requirement, not just a new requirement, also change in the requirement comes into play from the way a functional requirement, requirement is designed and developed. So we have to go back to the drawing board sometimes and then redo some of this development. So it's a never ending cycle. And that's a very big red flag. I, I use this concept of a goodie bag and uh, a box. Goodie bag is where you try to keep adding things, right? Nothing in this world is free. If you keep asking for something, a change in the staff, then that's going to cost you, you know, either your time, because sometimes the projects have tight uh, deadlines, and we want to make sure that we are meeting those deadlines by adding and changing the requirements, we are going to clip on the deadline. And number two, there is a defined effort for the scope. So we tend to go down the path of doing change requests to the project to add these requirements. So we got to be very careful about how we bring these requirements in. And I talk about a parking lot or a default requirements. Prioritize them if they are very critical to the success of the project and they are in the critical path of the project, then there should be an appropriate channel need to be in place to go through the project management or a project steering committee on the customer side. Make everyone aware that there are changes to this requirement and this is going to impede with the project, number one, financially because it's going to cost more. Number two, we are going to flip the date and that's going to impact not just, you know, from a development, but then if you are having you know, a testing team and these are outsourced testing team and they have been, you know, targeted to do this testing, then they have to go back to their drawing board and do the new test cases, create the data and do the regression testing across all the other aspects of the functional use case where the requirement may change. So it is better to avoid any kind of scope creep. And you all can relate to this personally and see how it's, you know, been um, impacted your own projects in a different way. And, you know, that needs to be taken into consideration. The other aspect, this is, um, you know, one of the most common scenarios where the scope creep comes into play, organization changes. An organization may expand, you know, like they're acquiring a new company. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they are, you know, a class, you know, we've seen the scenario where one customer has opened up an overseas office and they started hiring people. Mm -hmm. And they are different type of user population. Even though they are full-time employees of the organization, they are coming from a remote you know, a country, they don't really have all the permission, the rights, like a local employee has. So 
there are specific use cases and functional requirements that are brought in without evaluating the impact on the functional use cases or the requirements because it's a new type of user population has been identified. And these organization, organizational changes are important, right? Naturally, we need to accommodate those user populations. So how do we you know, balance this out? And of course, we need to evaluate the impact and the duration and see how it's going to impact the project. In an ideal scenario, the way, you know, most of the, you know, a prudent way to handle this would be to create a release schedule and say, hey, for release one, you're going to target the, you know, user population that's part of this project. But once we go into a testing mode into QA, our architects can review your requirements. It's in the parking lot. I'm going to bring those requirements back again and then go and start looking at the requirements in the design and make appropriate changes to the existing one and go through the development cycle while you guys do your QA. We will still go into production as agreed time frame, and then we are going to go within a week, two or three weeks or a month later with a new set of requirements that we identified that have to be in production. Rather than holding the entire project on, you know, half stage to this new requirement and then stopping everything and going back to the drawing board. So, you know, we got to exercise some amount of, you know, approval and, and engage with the um, customer project team as well and provide this, um, you know, um, the solution and still meeting the deadline that's needed. Um, another important step that we see is that accommodating the UI UX changes. So typically, the UAT cycle is when you have the end users coming into play. We have seen, and I'm in this, in a scenario where there is a contractor onboarding process that has been driven from a manual or a existing homegrown solution to, you know, through, a, through our solution. And the kind of interfaces that we created for contractor management and the UI and the user experience for the process was flagged down and said, well, this is not what we were expecting from those hiring managers' perspective. So some of these things shouldn't become an afterthought in an ideal scenario. We may have to do some prototypes during the development cycle, engage that end user team as part of those requirements in the design phase itself, and make sure their input is covered upfront, not at a later time. And this, again, is another form of scope creep because either we fumbled in the beginning of not engaging the right set of folks within the engage, you know, the requirements in a design phase, or we never got a sign off on these, even when people were engaged, or we never got a sign off on some of the UI UX components um, from the get-go. So we need to, uh, you know, apply some amount of um, prudence here as well and make sure that appropriate team is engaged at appropriate time and we actually avoid at any cost any kind of scope creep in different uh, perspectives and make sure that we provide, uh, you know, uh, or deliver value to the business and value to the project. So with that, I'm going to open up the line for some QA and um, um, you guys can ask me questions if you have and see how we can uh, you know, tackle them. We did get one comment, Molly, um, and just so you guys know, I did open a poll, so please rate today's webcast. We did get um, one question um, asking you to address best practices for providing realistic test data. Okay. So the best practices are on test data. Okay. The, fortunately, the way I have done is to look at realistic uh, production data and make sure that we identify all the functional use cases and related test cases. And we try to extract real data coming from the HR feed, and then we mask whatever personal information that we need to mask. We may create a fake user ID information that's in the data and you know, mask the names and any other personal information that may be there, but leave the code of triggers within the HR data pertaining to the test cases. This is where I have to put the emphasis on the test case. So test cases are driven from a functional requirement. A classic example of the functional requirement is a modifier user or a, you know, is a simple modifier user 
there's a data coming in, something is changed in his user profile data. And if you fill that layer, then there are individual attributes. You have your, your action code that says simply it's a modify operation. And then the reason code within that, it says it's an LOA, you know, it's a, um, it's a rehire probably. And then maybe uh, somebody's returning from LOA. Somebody is going on, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, military leave or on assignment. Um, so these individual codes will have different level of impact within the uh, behavior of the system in terms of executing the business rules. So we need to make sure that within that specific data set, we identify those functional requirements specific data points and the triggers for the business rules are identified in the test data markup. And it could, because that means we may have to go back to, you know, five days, 10 days worth of, or maybe a month old data to look for the specific triggers, or ideally mark up your data to match these triggers within the business rule so it is evaluated. And another point I would like to, you know, pinpoint as part of the test cases, I think I uh, skipped on it, is the uh, negative testing. That is another key aspect where the amount of time that's spent in certain projects for the specific set of data, right? Trying to use IDM as a catch-all data, bad data coming in from HR. We are not the, um, you know, guardians of bad data that is coming in. I, we as in the solution should not be the guardian of that, vetting the data out. It's a garbage in, garbage out. This is where you need to have some default catch-all situation. If any of the triggers are not triggered, and you are not going to be able to assign a job function specific role or able to perform a you know, specific, um, meet some you know, business rules or not triggered because of that data, we should not be spending a lot of time in the system to say, what would the system do and how can we avoid the system not to do something it shouldn't be doing. Rather, it should be a catch-all and it has to do something default. And then the next iteration, the problem is addressed, the bad data is fixed, at source, and then the system will address and update the user record properly in the IDM system. So the negative testing is another place where customers do get hung up on it and trying to make the system to do a lot of validation and try to create a lot of exception handling. And that could also drag your testing cycle um, from your primary focus of validating the functional requirements. All right, great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. If anyone has a question, you can enter it in the chat window or the Q&A window. You can also ask a question by hitting pound six or star six to unmute your line, or you can press the phone icon with the question mark and I can unmute your line for you. So I'll pause for a moment while we wait for any questions. We do have one question. Um, with the assumption that scope and requirement should be fixed, is there ever a scenario where an identity management project would be executed in an agile way? Yes. Um, we are seeing more and more agile uh, projects coming into play for the exact reason that I was mentioning before, time to value. And uh, agile really fits into um, that um, executing the project to meet those uh, time to value situation is where, you know, you are going to achieve the time to value. Because most um, IDM projects are varying degree could, you know, from a nine months to a 24 month project based on how much of the functional use case and requirements are in play. And um, we have been very adaptive in terms of delivering this um, solution in a very agile mode. And I personally was involved in delivering um, the project in agile mode where it was, you know, we had a very um, rigid time constraints and we have to be in production uh, by a certain date. Um, there is, people are going to, you know, lose the funding, there are a lot of other impacts in the project. 
So as we were doing the um, development cycle, we finished use cases, and then we will throw it over the fence, migrate them to QA, and the QA team will be testing that specific use case. And while we are still developing the uh, project, uh, you know, for additional use cases, and there are multiple people involved in delivering multiple use cases simultaneously. So we were, you know, we kind of it's a hybrid. We kind of define requirements and design upfront, and then the development cycle. We adopted Agile to, you know, be more responsive in terms of addressing the time constraint. Um, the other scenario Agile could be, you know, creating uh, a roadmap, time to value roadmap, and then identify at least you do a full blown requirement, and then you lay out a time to value roadmap at the end of the requirement to say, release one you are going to do X Y Z, and this is we have um, done very successfully for. Um, um, in a wireless company where we actually had some release schedules within phase one. And this is actually we finished requirements and we developed, put, up, put together a roadmap for different release schedule. And the design was completed for all release schedule. And then when we went with the development mode, we were start releasing a different user population at different times while there were additional you know, rules and functionalities being built and deliver it as they were going into production. So it was actually release one goes to production and then release two simultaneously being developed and tested and going into production. So yes, we see Agile being in play in a lot, lot more in recent times and a lot of projects. Okay, great. Thank you, Molly. I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, if anyone has a question, you can hit pound six or star six to unmute your line. But I just want to thank Molly um, and the rest of the security team for hosting this webcast today. Like I said, we will be posting the slides and the recording to the CA security community, which you can find at ca.com slash talk security. But I will be following up via email with everyone who attended today with links to those slides and the recording. So if there are no other questions today, we'll go ahead and end today's webcast. Thank you everyone for joining and I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Molly.